Earlier this month, three people died and some 80 were wounded in violent clashes between hardline Buddhists and Muslims in southern Sri Lanka. The attacks are the latest in a series of religious clashes to hit the island and followed a protest march led by the right-wing Buddhist group Bodu Balasena, or Buddhist Power Force, after they tried to march in a largely Muslim area. Muslims make up about 10% of Sri Lanka's population and some analysts believe the well-coordinated violence indicates a state backing. It's an accusation the government denies. Del Irani spoke to Dr Saravanamuttu, Executive Director of the Centre for Policy Alternatives, an independent think tank in Sri Lanka, and JC Williamuna, who chairs the Sri Lankan branch of Transparency International. Mr. Weli Amuna and Dr. Saravan Amutu, thank you for your time. So it's been five years since the civil war ended in Sri Lanka. How has the situation changed in that country? I think five years after the end of the war, what you've got is Sri Lanka in a post-war situation. The war has ended, but the conflict still continues. The sources of conflict need to be addressed. Unfortunately, the trajectory of events suggests that they are being sustained and reproduced. And in fact, new sources of conflict, like religious intolerance resulting in violence, have now also come onto the agenda. So it's rather unfortunate that we have a current situation in which institutionalized militarization, near collapse of the rule of law, as well as religious intolerance, suggests that reconciliation is still a long way off. Let's talk specifically about the in the Tamil region, so that's the north and the east of the country. We're still seeing large numbers of um, Tamils leaving Sri Lanka. If things have changed, why is that the case? You have a military involved in the economy, you know, growing vegetables, selling vegetables, running hotels, you name it. They're involved in civilian governance as well. And there, there's a large presence of the military in various guises, from the armed forces personnel to military intelligence, etc. The people there still feel as if they're under occupation or subjected to a great deal of suspicion. The wartime paradigm still persists. I understand that your background is Tamil, and Mr. William Uma, you are uh, Sinhalese. So how important is it for the both of you to maintain your objectivity uh, um, and, but at the same time to represent your different ethnic communities? Well, I wouldn't want to uh, label myself as only representing my ethnic community. I hope I represent my fellow country people who believe in democratic governance irrespective of ethnicity and religion. But it is tremendously important that we cross as many barriers, as, as many divisions, as many sort of different identities and ensure that a multi-ethnic, multi-religious, plural Sri Lanka, and those who subscribe to that notion and cherish it, fight to preserve it. Uh, those who are not with the government and critical are living in fear. And we uh, uh, stand up, and not only two of us, and there are a large number of people who are willing to speak up, although they do not get uh, sufficient space in the media, there is a moment within Sri Lanka to take up this. So you're Sinhalese, but even if you speak up against the government, you're putting yourself in danger? Yes, of course. I mean, the, I mean I've mean, i gone through the mill. My house was bombed some time back. Uh, there are so many Sinhalese who speak up, irrespective of ethnic boundaries. I think the question is Sri Lanka is not limited to the ethnic issue. I mean, it's a much more bigger issue of collapse of rule of law. Can you tell us about the Bodu Balasena? How, how much power does this Buddhist right-wing extremist group really uh, wield in Sri Lanka? It has been supported and covered and given protect, uh, even protected by uh, uh, the government. How is the government using this group? Well, it is used. Uh, you can see the government is working in a, in a sense of uh, uh, impunity. And they probably do, ex do not expect minorities to support during next elections. They want to ensure that a very high majority of the singular Buddhists will support the government. So they are... Uh, they are uh, using Badubala Sena to maintain that at very high level so that the government will protect them. There will be a, a ethnic turmoil in the country which, uh, of, of which the government will be the beneficiary. That's how they read, but I don't think that that can be sustained without the support of the government anyway. What role can Australia play as a member of the international community and a member of the Commonwealth in helping, you know, bring these, in helping Sri Lanka achieve a state of democracy, a rule of law? I think it's incumbent on members of the Commonwealth like Australia 
to monitor that and to tell the government of Sri Lanka, who is after all now the chairperson of the Commonwealth, that this is totally unacceptable. So strength and solidarity and support to those who are fighting for democratic governance there and at an international level to put pressure on the government to live up to its international commitments with regard to good governance. I believe that Australia should look beyond the board people. I mean, the issue in Sri Lanka is, uh, may not be directly linked to only the board people. So uh, Australia and all other Commonwealth countries should make sure that the government of Sri Lanka respects Commonwealth values. And also, we need to make sure that people-to-people -people engagements are much stronger, and even the parliamentarians and the policymakers of Australia must get the pulse of people in Sri Lanka. Mr. William Una and Dr. Saravanamitu, thank you so much for your time. Thank you.